Before we go ahead, let me uh, bring to the show uh, Alan Friedman, American uh, author and journalist. Good evening, Alan, and thank you for joining us. Good evening. Alan, I'd like to start um, with the trade spat between the United States and China. We got some news. I was just saying a few seconds ago that uh, actually trade talks are going to resume at the beginning of October. We do see um, kind of overreaction of the U.S. indices uh, because we've heard that kind of stories also uh, before. What, are, what is your opinion on the trade talks and the trade spat as a whole? And do you think the reaction of the U.S. indices is a little bit um, exaggerated. Well, Wall Street was just hoping and praying for an excuse to have a rally. After all, it's been a really rough time. And Donald Trump's uh, China policy, his trade war against China, has spooked the markets, frightened Wall Street, and is, ex is the reason why there have been several uh, big drops uh, in recent weeks, especially during the uh, G7 as well at the Biarritz. And Trump even made up phony stories about China and about phone calls he had in the night, which again caused investors to think the American president is not a serious person or he has no real strategy. Uh, now we see the White House saying talks will resume in October, and that is a good reason to be uh, fingers crossed. But to think that Donald Trump will fix this problem by October, I don't think so. So I think this is a, a reason to hope, but uh, the market will go up and down. It will be a volatile time in the next few months in Wall Street because Trump's impulsive nature and his um, changeability uh, is, is a problem. And that includes his willingness to attack uh, Europe and to attack China on trade. Every time he attacks, the market goes down. Absolutely, and we do see Europe is really um, suffering a lot um, after those tariffs. Actually, over the weekend, we saw tariffs ramped up once again. Uh, but let me ask you, um, it, uh, in 2020, we're going to see the next presidential elections in the United States. So, so do you think that Trump is more willing um, to, to have a trade deal? Because I, I think this is going to be the major uh, topic during his presidential campaign. You know, I wrote a book called This Is Not America. I wrote about Trump. I interviewed Trump. I know Trump. I, for the first time, begin to think that Trump might lose the election. And until now, until now, I've been pretty sure that he would continue to use fear and anger and uh, racism and all his tactics and trade wars to try to win. But I think with the economy may be risking not recession, but a slowdown in the American economy. And with the Fed, you know, under constant attack from Trump, this is not good for financial markets and investors when the president of the United States attacks the president of the Federal Reserve Board. Not good. Everybody knows that. So we're living in very strange times with an unnatural president who does unnatural things. So I don't know. I, I think for the first time, however, the, the new polls I've seen in the last few days indicate that the Democrats, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, could be 12 percentage points higher than Trump, meaning right now they're polling around 52 percent of the vote. You ask the American voters if an election were held today, who would you vote for? And 52 percent of them vote for any Democrat, not even with a name anybody but Trump. And Trump is still at 40 percent, 41 percent. So that's 11 or 12 percentage points difference. And no American president has been that far down uh, just this close to the election. So a lot can change in the next year. The election is in November 2020. But I think like Salvini in Italy and Boris Johnson in, in London, Donald Trump is his own worst enemy. And I think these politicians don't get defeated by other parties. They destroy themselves by exaggerating and by being too extremist. And eventually, the parliament and the peoples rebel. I think Trump could lose the election of 2020, yes. 
Well, that's an extremely um, interesting topic. So do you think um, together with Trump, uh, the, the populism wave is going to slightly disappear? Well, let's put it this way. One down, two to go. In terms of America and Europe, we, you know, Salvini is out. The sovereignist threat, the populist right-wing, uh, ethno-populist Steve Bannon brand of uh, hatred and right-wing extremism in Italy is gone. In England, the parliament is saying to Boris Johnson, don't be a mini-Trump. And another one of Trump's key populist friends and allies, Boris Johnson, is having a difficult time. So I think, yes, if Italy was first and England comes second, why shouldn't Trump leave the White House uh, next year after he loses? I think it's possible. That's extremely interesting. I hope you're going to have the chance to talk about it uh, once again. But let me ask you, what is your opinion in terms of central banks? We know that Trump is slamming the Fed every single day, almost on Twitter. Um, do, you, do you think that there is, a, there is a reason, actually, because we do see pretty stable um, U.S. economy? You, we got new data today. Um, actually, we got a little bit of disappointing results, but nothing uh, special. So, so far, the U.S economy is the strongest one compared to Europe, also Asia and Africa, uh, excluding economies like Switzerland that cannot be compared to, to the United States uh, for, for the huge difference, actually, as a, as a population and everything. So, so what are your thoughts? Do you think that um, the Federal Reserve has to cut rates, actually, as Trump is suggesting, in order to save the U.S. economy? Well, I think it's a very complicated issue. Let me try to break it down into three simple pieces. Point one, the U.S. economy is slowing down to growth of around 2%, maybe even 1.9% this year. Now, it's not a crash, but it's not 3%. And the latest data shows that there's the first contraction in American manufacturing sector in August in three years. So that's a negative indicator. The key bond market indicators are all suggesting that we are going to be, not now, but maybe in six months, in recession risk. And at the same time, the Federal Reserve is supposed to be an independent central bank, just like the European Central Bank is supposed to be an independent central bank, independent of political power. Uh, so to do a good job of, of running monetary policy. Trump is trying to threaten the president of the Federal Reserve to cut rates to compensate with the problems he's having in GDP growth being lower, in part because of his trade war with China. So Trump, on the one hand, causes a loss of confidence, causes lower trade, higher tariffs, and a slowing of economic growth. And the other hand, he asked the Fed to cut rates to stimulate the uh, growth pattern, which is nonsense. An independent central banker like Jay Powell at the Fed has said, and he said this at, uh, recently in Jackson Hole, he said, uh, the American Fed chairman, uh, we are not here to manage economic policy based on trade policy. And at the same time, the European Central Bank uh, was under attack by the populists of Italy, is still under attack by some right-wing populists in Italy and Europe, but under Christine Lagarde will continue the very dovish policy of Mario Draghi. And of course, on the 12th of September, I expect Draghi's last great bazooka. On the 12th of September in Frankfurt, I'm looking forward to a cut in interest rates. Yes, it means more negative interest rates, and that's a whole nother subject. But more QE2, some bond buying, some corporate bond buying, some titoli di stato, some of the you know, treasury notes. I think Draghi and the bank uh, will launch another round. And I think Christine Lagarde, when she arrives November 1st at the central bank, will continue Draghi's uh, accommodating uh, monetary policy. Yeah, that's very interesting. Actually, I was about to ask you 
if you believe that the new pre uh, the new president of the ECB is going to uh, how can I say impose a different monetary policy very different from from Mario Draghi we've heard her uh, first speeches only yesterday no. and actually she was very eager she said that actually uh, the, the different countries have to help the central banks by their by more, by more sufficient fiscal policy and make their life central bankers life easier indeed well the point I, I think that's relevant for uh, the eurozone right now is that Lagarde will be more of the same she's a different personality she's uh, more extroverted than uh, Mario Draghi Mario Draghi was very buttoned down very calm very uh, careful with his, the words and Christine Lagarde is more outspoken a bit more of a politician she is a politician and in fact some people have criticized her appointment, saying this is a politician. But even though she was Sarkozy's uh, faithful um, economy minister in France uh, in the old days, in the last eight years in Washington, as head of the IMF, she's proven herself one of the world's great leaders in, in the financial world, uh, a feminist, a liberal, and a charismatic person. I think she'll do a great job at the ECB. Yeah, I agree. She is extremely charismatic. Let's see what she's going to bring to the to the Europeans, especially. Alan, um, in the last few minutes of our interview, I'd like to talk about your new book. Actually, let me show it to our viewers. Here it is, Democracy in Peril, uh, Donald Trump's America. Let me start uh, from something um, very interesting for me um, and also for, for Lefonti's viewers. And this is um, to, to, the parallels between Trump and Narendra Mon Modi. Uh, can you explain us why did you decide to, to, how can I say, to compare the two leaders and what did you figure out during your uh, examination? Well, I think it's worth pointing out that Democracy in Peril is uh, the new book that I published <clears throat> in India in uh, New Delhi and uh, Bombay. And it contains special chapters about Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, and about uh, Donald Trump, and about the relationship between India and Pakistan and America. These are very sensitive subjects in India. But for your viewers in the subcontinent, I can say that I compare Trump, Trump and Modi as personalities, as politicians. They're both um, uh, people who uh, tend to denigrate the independence of the judiciary and tend to not be always in favor of a free press. Uh, there are people who tend to like other strongmen, politicians like Putin, like Orban, uh, like Boris Johnson. Uh, they get on well with other strong leaders. And I point out that this is part of a trend toward illiberal democracy. But since I wrote the book, it's worth pointing it out that with Salvini um, out and Boris Johnson in trouble and Trump falling in the opinion polls, maybe there's some hope that the world will come back to its senses. In the case of India, uh, India is an extraordinary country with a wonderful economy uh, that's grown enormously, like five times in the last 20 years. And the stock market of the Sensex is a fascinating and pre pretty reliable stock market as well with amazing growth potential still, because India is still a developing country, even though it's been growing at a rapid pace for 20 years. So I'm a big fan of India. I launched my first um, uh, India Bollywood television program in 2003, working with Rupert Murdoch's uh, Star TV channel. And we brought uh, Donatella Versace to Bombay for a reality program in India. It's a country that uh, has economic potential for for Europe that must be understood better, I think, because the trading opportunity there is a great one. Uh, this is really uh, this is really fantastic, um, Alan. During uh, while we were writing the book, actually, you were also in the United States and in the how can I say the smaller cities. And as you point out, that the United States is not only uh, New York or California or Washington. Can you tell us more about um, your visiting of smaller cities and the different the different opinion of the people? Well, in the book, we're talking about. Um, 
which is available on Amazon, but you have to go to like Amazon India, Amazon.co.in uh, to get Democracy in Peril. Uh, I talk about the flyover territory, that part of America between New York and California that most members of the elite media establishment or politics or finance only see from an airplane going across it. Kansas, Illinois, Missouri, New Mexico, the Ohio, and so all of that flyover territory. And I went through Mississippi and Alabama and South Carolina and any of these states, and I met with the real people of America, including the poor, to get an idea of who Trump supporters were, what the Americans really want. And what I found was very disturbing at times in terms of the poverty, in terms of the racism, in terms of what has happened to my country, because I am an American and I love my country. But under Donald Trump, I am concerned that social inequality and um, destruction of the environment and uh, a lack of rights for minorities and women and gay people uh, and immigrants will change America and make it a less friendly place and a more ugly place. So that's why uh, I'm hoping also for the economy and for finance that Trump is replaced next year. Because if you think about it, Trump's economic policy did not stimulate growth long term. It was a 18 month uh, impulse he gave by cutting uh, one and a half trillion dollars of taxes for corporations. But that money didn't go into creating new jobs. It's been used for share buybacks, for M&A activity, and just to basically increase dividends to shareholders. So Donald Trump's economic policy didn't really create the kind of boom that is lasting and sustainable. So what we're going to have now is a downward tendency over the next six to 12 months. And Trump might find himself in the middle of his election campaign with an economy risking recession. That could happen. Exactly. And historically, uh, when a country or when the U.S. went into recession, the president never got reelected. So let's see what is going to happen. Thank you so much, Alan Friedman, American journalist and author. Thank you for joining us and thank you for the chat. Thank you. Have a All great evening, Alan. Thank you and you.